The British began by executing the rebel leaders. In his final hours, Pierce wrote letters to his mother and brother. Pierce was first to be executed, along with Thomas Clark and Thomas McDonough, May 3, 1916. Pierce's little brother Willie would never receive the letter. Though only a foot soldier in the Rising, he would be punished for his family name. He was executed May 4, 1916. Joseph Plunkett married his fiancée, Grace, in a jailhouse ceremony the night before his execution, also on May 4th. James Connolly, the military leader, had been gravely wounded in the fighting. He had to be strapped to a chair, barely alive so he could be shot with the proper pomp and circumstance on May 12th, 1916. It was a colossal, colossal mistake on Britain's part. They managed to ruin it on themselves by moving ahead and executing 15 of them, um, and summarily, one day after another. But if they had dumped them into prison, these men would have been objects of contempt and pity. Instead, they became heroes. The executions were a harsher punishment than the Irish had imagined or wanted. Adding to their shock were the stories coming from Kilmainham Jail of the rebels' final hours and bravery in the face of death. The manner in which they were tried and executed uh, generated a great deal of public outrage at, at the conduct of, of British military forces. Countess Markievicz kissed her revolver before handing it over to British forces. Spared execution because she was a woman, she is said to have remarked, I do wish your lot had the decency to shoot me. I think by the time they reached the 15th death, it was beginning to dawn on the British that this was a very counterproductive exercise. Facing growing public outcry, the British halted the executions. Eamon de Valera, the former math teacher, was spared. He and other rebels were sent to prison. The interesting thing about their jail experience was that a new generation of Irish Republicans emerged in that jail. And through the study of the Irish language and the playing of Gaelic games, etc., organized uh, the IRB uh, with a new leadership that came right out back into Ireland, ready to go all over again. Upon his release from jail a year later, de Valera was exalted to hero status. He found that the Irish once a difficult population to unite, were finally coming together in their resolve for freedom. One of the things that happened is that the revolutionary and military struggle had begun to be mythologized. This gets back to the central question about the 1916 Rising. Is, is it an event in military history or is it an event in intellectual, cultural uh, history? Riding a wave of popular support, de Valera helped lead Ireland into a full-scale war of independence against Britain in 1919. The war ended two years later with a partial victory for Ireland. Its southern counties won independence, but six mostly Protestant counties in Northern Ireland remained under British rule and became home to fierce guerrilla violence for the next several decades. Many of Pierce's original disciples formed the radical Irish Republican Army and fought on behalf of Catholics in the North. And the sad tragedy of 1916 is that it institutionalized the use of violence and it made the gun a permanent fixture in Irish politics right down to the present day. Irish writer Sean O'Fallon wrote about Ireland after 1916. The Easter Rising was a complete failure, which left large parts of Dublin in ruins. Yet without it, Ireland might never have been free of English rule. The leaders, alive, had very few supporters, even among the Irish patriots. Dead, they became and have remained their country's heroes. It was a great historical paradox, and one that to this day the British have perhaps never understood. Had they understood it, it is conceivable 
that the British might still have an empire.